This is Nick Black, and today I'm talking to actor, director, producer Mark Rydell at Big Time Editing Studio, where Mark is post-producing his latest film, James Dean. But first of all, Mark, I want to go right back to New York. What got you interested in being an actor? My father was a stockbroker, and uh, since every youth, or most every youth, rebels against the constrictions that his father places on him, I went as far from stockbrokering as I could possibly go, and I was always interested in the arts. I was originally was a pianist. I started to study piano and found that to be a great escape from the turmoil of my house, of my family dynamics. I became rapidly successful as a pianist. I was playing professionally when I was 15 or 16 years old. Jazz. I had a career as a jazz musician. I went to Juilliard. I went to Chicago Musical College and I played jazz in the army. But then because of the fact that in those days, jazz was the home of drugs, heroin was a, a serious problem in those days, as it is today, but in those days it was particularly related to jazz musicians. It frightened me. Many of my friends had real tragic experiences. Some OD'd and died, and I decided to quit, went back to college, and then quickly transferred my allegiances to the theater and went to the Maywood Playhouse School of the Theater because I had no place to pour all my talent and found a home. Tell us a little bit about the early days there in New York. Was it easy to, to get your initial first break? Well, you know, this was the 50s. The 50s was like the Renaissance in New York. It was exploding with talent, with all the best writers and the best directors and the best actors. It was live television. And live television in New York in the 50s was so exciting. As a matter of fact, we deal with that period in the picture that I just made about James Dean because James Dean was a friend of mine and we kind of grew up in the theater together and shared experiences and were friends during that very very rich, wonderful period where there were many, many live shows done and actors were, generally speaking, the arts in general was exploding in New York. Next stop, Greenwich Village. That's right. Very, very, very like Paul Bezersky's film. Indeed. So you get caught up in that milieu. When do you start? Because it's very difficult to make a living as an actor. When did the money sort of start rolling in? <laughs> Well, you know, it is difficult to make a living as an actor, but I was very fortunate when I left the Neighborhood Playhouse. I went right to Broadway. I was in a play on Broadway. It wasn't a success, but I made a kind of mark for myself. And then I got the job that saved my financial life. I became a regular on a soap opera called As the World Turns. And for six years, I did that, played a leading man on As the World Turns, and that paid for my development, my rent, my psychoanalysis, all the things that are necessary for anybody who wants to become healthy. So I didn't have any problem uh, working regularly as an actor. Did you have in the back of your mind being a director or was that something that sort of fell into your lap? Well, when I was a pianist, I wanted to be a conductor. And when I was an actor, I wanted to be a director. I think my natural inclinations are toward leading as opposed to following. I have the greatest admiration for actors. I think that they are a great breed and one of the bravest professions that I know. But I prefer leading them, although I do enjoy acting occasionally. I acted in this picture with James Dean. About James Dean, I play Jack Warner. How do you take the jump from actor to director? Did you start directing theatrical shows or did you go straight to TV, being a TV actor? Well, first I was a member of the actor studio. I began to direct in the director's unit of the actor studio and then began to direct some television, public television in New York. And when the opportunity arose for me to come to California to become a kind of assistant on the Ben Casey show, I jumped at the chance. I quit my television show, which was paying me quite a bit of money. And I came to California to be a director because that was the promise when I was given the opportunity to be an assistant. And I worked for three months regularly on the Ben Casey show until one day the late producer Matt Rapp gave me a script and said here and from that day on I have stopped. Do you have vivid memories of that first Ben Casey that you directed? Indeed I do. Richard Basehart was a star that I used and Piper Laurie. I had a wonderful cast and I had a terrific time. I prepared tremendously with great preparation so that I could have a successful show and we did have a very successful show and that opened the doors for me. Was it more after you did it was it more satisfying than acting? Did you find it more of a challenge or would you class them equal? You know they're two entirely different talents. An actor has to surrender his judgmental abilities. An actor cannot 
judge himself while he's acting because to the extent that he's judging himself he's not acting he's not lost in the material the director on the other hand his judgmental faculties are always on the alert you have to understand acting and you but you have to be able to evaluate what's happening all the time so they are two distinctly different talents i always wondered how some of the great directors like Orson Welles or even Woody Allen can direct themselves and star in pictures because of the very difference that's necessary the ability to surrender judgmental faculties when you're acting and the ability to regain your judgmental faculties when you're judging <laughs> but I found that I was able to do it this is the first time I acted in a picture that I've directed and I played a large role I found that I could do it were you hard on yourself uh, I must have been that's an interesting question was I hard on myself I guess you know one wants to be good because everyone's their own hardest critic aren't they I guess that's so and I guess I did make real demands on myself and I'm very pleased with the results you cast yourself a good part Jack Warner he was a bit of a ruthless type wasn't he he was even against his own brothers too wasn't he he was quite a cruel man but he also had an instinct many of those moguls in that period had that's unfortunately missing in today's movie world since the movies have become corporate those seat of the pants guys who operate on instinct while indeed they were ruthless and devastatingly cruel when necessary they did have a kind of passion that made movies better i think movies have become far less talented since the corporate invasion of the motion picture industry well let's go back to those pre-corporate days so you establish yourself as a tv director and then comes the fox now we're just talking about the leap from actor to director well how is the leap from director of episodic television to major motion pictures well you know in the those days the people who were making inexpensive pictures like the fox which by the way was made for 1 million dollars those people are searching for the hot television directors who will accept the lowest salaries and who are passionate to do a kind of piece of material and when the fox was submitted to me this gave me the opportunity that i wanted the dh lawrence patina of respectability and at the same time a daring sexual and quite mysterious piece of material i loved it and i sacrificed quite a bit both financially and emotionally to do that picture but the picture it put me on the map it won the best picture of the year the golden globes and all of a sudden my next picture was with Steve McQueen the Reavers I leapt 20 steps and became a frontline director right away well i remember watching the fox as a very young lad and i liked certain scenes especially with Anne Haywood the cast is really strong how did you choose your cast man Anne Haywood came with the package her husband was the producer i cast Sandy Dennis and Care Dulay i cast out of the act studio as often as i can because that's where the real talent is okay we're talking about the reavers now which starred steve mcqueen he had a bit of a reputation as a bit of a wild man maybe i don't know what can you confirm or deny i confirm it without hesitation <laughs> that uh, steve mcqueen was a uh, borderline psychotic very difficult you never could anticipate what he would bring to the set each day it also made him a very exciting actor but he was a rather difficult guy very 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 frightened of competition and deeply in need of controlling things and we had quite a few battles on the picture because there really can only be one leader on a picture and I had that conversation with him and I told him that leader is me although you know he was the one who gave me the picture so I was taking a real chance we went to school together at the Naywood Playhouse and John Houston and Willie Wyler were both supposed to do the picture and they dropped out for various reasons and suddenly it became available and my agent who was very clever Joe was in from William Morris he went and sat on a plane with Steve McQueen and by the time they got off the plane together I had the picture but it was difficult it was very difficult Steve was a difficult guy it was a beautiful picture i remember i saw it quite a while ago and i really enjoyed it and it was another picture based on another classic author first day age Lawrence and William Faulkner how do you approach a classic pick of literature because you're going to have people out there saying well you know you might destroy it the, the first thing to remember is that you're changing the form a novel is not a movie a short story is not a play you are literally changing the form and you have to feel free enough to change the form you have to adhere to the essence of the material with a kind of determined and committed honorable approach but you have to be willing to change things because you have the visual tools to express many wonderful ideas without a lot of language in fact steve and i had some fights over that he didn't like to 
be as voluble as Faulkner and wanted to cut a lot of the language and I insisted that he speak it. There's a couple of people I want to ask you about. I was a big fan of Rupert Cross. Now, fortunately he had a relatively short life. Can you tell me a bit about Rupert? Well, Rupert was a wonderful, gangly black, one of the first uh, successful black actors who played this major leading role opposite Steve in The Reavers. Unfortunately, my memory uh, tells me that we had a bet every week Steve and I and who would smoke first and uh, I think it was for a hundred dollars a week and I won every week because I stopped smoking and those guys couldn't and both died. Rupert died of lung cancer within a year after making the Reavers and Steve also died of cancer as you know. It was an inveterate smoker as well. And little Mitch Vogel. I do remember him uh, very well. I haven't kept track of him. I don't know what's happened to him. I saw him once on a television show and there he was a grown-up man and it made me so upset because I realized how old I had become. But I really haven't followed his career. So he's still acting then? He was a few years ago. I want to get on to the Cowboys quickly with another legendary actor, John Wayne. Can you tell us a little bit about Mr. Wayne? Mr. Marion. John Wayne. Well, I didn't want him for the picture. Why, Mark? He, you know, he had a reputation of being a bigot and a right-wing enthusiast. And as a matter of fact, he was one of the architects of the blacklist in Hollywood. And we couldn't have had more opposing political sympathies. So I didn't really want him for the picture. The studio insisted that I go down and see him because he really wanted to be in the picture. So John Kelly and I got in the studio plane and flew to Mexico where he was shooting. And to my astonishment, I met a gentleman, a charming, gracious, a determined, decent, and quite intelligent guy. I was quite surprised. It turned out that we had made an agreement. I said, well, let's never talk politics, never, because you and I are deadly enemies in politics, but let's talk acting. And he was challenged by that, and he knew I was a kind of a dignitary at the actor's studio, and, and I surrounded him with actors like Bruce Dern and Roscoe Lee Brown, who were both actor studio people, and Sarah Cunningham, various people. He was surrounded by young, enthusiastic people, not his normal cronies, and he was challenged by it. And I must tell you, I feel he rose to meet that challenge, and he felt the same way. Let's get on to Cinderella Liberty with Jimmy Khan, who you've worked with quite a few times. Very, very highly critically acclaimed film. Can you tell us a little bit about Cinderella Liberty? That was one of my favorite films. A wonderful romantic tale from a rather large tome by Daryl Ponison, a tone about bureaucracy from which we extracted one chapter, which was about his romance, a sailor's romance with a prostitute. And we developed the screenplay about that one chapter. And I had a wonderful time, of course. I introduced Marsha Mason, who had only played one small role, and oddly enough, a Paul Mazursky picture prior to that. And I introduced her in this big role. You know, every major actress wanted it. Was she married to Simon at the time? No, she married Simon about three weeks after the completion of Cinderella Liberty. Faye Dunaway, Jane Fonda, all the big stars at that time wanted to play this part. And I was looking for locations in San Francisco and other places, and I happened to be in San Francisco looking for naval bases, and I had nothing to do one night. Went into the Geary Theater and saw a Marsha play in a doll's house, the Ibsen play. was so stunned that I called the studio and I said, I found the girl for Cinderella Liberty. And they said, what do you mean you found the girl? What about Jane Fonda? What about Faye Dunaway? I said, no, 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 this is the girl. And they were so furious with me. And they said, okay, but they cut my budget in half. A week into shooting, they sent me a wire saying if they had the choice of any actress in the world, they would have chosen Marsha Mason. That was a good choice. Yeah, vindication. I want to go on to The Rose because that was a very, very successful film. It was based on Janis Joplin. Some of the concert sequences were just so big, and that was, I think, one of the first movies where they really made it look spectacular. Logistically, it would have been your most difficult movie. Would that be correct? It's hard to tell. It was a very difficult movie. We had nine cameras shooting at once on those concerts, which were all Live. There was no post-recording, no pre-recording. It was all done in front of a real audience, really live. And it was, of course, Marsha Mason was nominated for an Academy Award, as was Bad for playing the role. It was indeed based originally on the Janis Joplin story, but I felt that it was not the way to do it. It was better to create a fictional character based on the spirit of Joplin, because creating a fictional character gives you more permission to adjust the life story to suit your needs and to make a drama out of it. 
it. So we used many, many, many elements of Janis Joplin's life, but we also fictionalized quite a bit. Just quickly want to get on to probably the film that you are most associated with, which is on Golden Pond, and you're directing another legend from old Hollywood, Henry Fonda, who was very ill at the time. Can you tell me a little bit about that? He was ill at the time, wasn't he? As a matter of fact, he did not become really ill till after the film. The film breathed life into him. In spite of the fact that he had two pacemakers and had suffered serious heart problems, the film breathed life into him. And he loved the experience with Catherine Hepburn as I did. And also it was a very significant film in relation to his daughter because he had been estranged from his daughter for some time. As a matter of fact, she bought the play in order to have a reconciliation with him. As you remember, very much a part of the film, a daughter reconciling with her father. And they did indeed reconcile in life. And so it's a perfect example of life serving art. But he didn't really become seriously ill till afterwards. As a matter of fact, Jane called me about five months after we finished shooting. I just finished cutting and she didn't know that. She said, you better show the picture to him because he may not last. And I said, oh my God. I said, of course. And he came to the studio in the limousine and people had to help him out of the car. He was very frail. I sat him down, run the film and I left because I couldn't bear to sit there with him while he was watching it. And I came back exactly when it was over and he stood up and he walked toward me, very fragile, very fragile. And he tripped just before he came to me and he fell into my arms and I held him in my arms and he was shaking and I thought oh my god he's going to die right here and he felt like a bird you know you could feel the bones under his flesh he thanked me for what he thought was the highlight of his career and I said it's not only the highlight of your career but it's it's a highlight of my life to have you say those things to me he was a great great actor it was a privilege to work with him. Your next movie, The River, was the leading man with somebody at the opposite end of the scale, somebody just beginning his career. Mel Gibson, of course, who's gone on to one of the biggest in Hollywood. He's a monster. Wonderful, wonderful guy. And I really loved working with him and Sissy Spacek, who again was nominated for that picture. It was a great privilege to put Mel in his first American film, really. You know, I didn't want him either to start. I thought he could never do a real Tennessee accent, and he fooled me. And a wonderful ear and a wonderful talent. He was a terrific terrific guy. I love working with him. I would love to work with him again. Also, for the boys start, Bette Midler and Jimmy Kahn, and also it featured a role by a fellow called Christopher Rydell. Now, who is Christopher Rydell? Yeah. As you must guess, yeah. that was my son, and I was so proud of him in that picture. He really played a great part. He also plays a part in James Dean, and my daughter also plays a part in the James Dean part. It was like a family affair. He's a wonderful actor and a terrific young man. Hoping to follow in the footsteps of his old man? I think he does have in mind to become a director, and he certainly has the talent for it. He's a wonderful actor, a very handsome, good-looking guy. All the women are crazy for him, but he has the brains of a, of a director. I want to go on to a film called Intersection, which was based on a French film. I heard bad things about it and I don't think it did well and I finally got around to seeing it and I was really blown away by it. I thought everyone was great in it and I haven't seen the original French film but why do you think that was just so harsh on the movie? Was it the actor's persona or I was really surprised. Well, I think you've touched an interesting nerve. I think the truth about that film is that the film belongs in a French culture. It's about a man who leaves his wife and child and has a deep and resounding affair while maintaining his relationship to his wife and child. And that's not American. American Puritanism reacted negatively to that concept. They want the man to return to his wife. And this was a man who uh, did not do so. I was very proud of the picture. I love the picture. I think it's stylish and it's uh, exciting. But I think its essential thematic material is alien to American culture. Okay, now let's get on to your current project, James Dean. Now, I've got here James Dean and Invented Life. Is that the title? It is. James Dean and Invented Life. It's a screenplay that's been Warner Brothers since 1992 and had many, many incarnations, uh, many, many drafts, nine drafts when I came on the picture. The studio never quite had the courage to go forward with that kind of a picture. Those kind of pictures are rarely made today. Character studies, examinations, psychological examination of a young man is not the nature of studio pictures now where they're in pursuit of the 11 year old audience and becomes like a thrill ride at uh, Disneyland or something. Most of these pictures are very difficult to watch and I think they've alienated a whole adult audience by this greed passion to for the hundred million dollar grocer. But when Bill Gerber, who was an executive at Warner Brothers, left Warner Brothers, part of this deal was that he would take Jimmy Dean with him and he set it up immediately at Turner and they called me right away because of my knowledge of the actor studio and acting and growing up with Jimmy Dean and hope for other reasons as well. And 
And it's been one of the most glorious experiences of my life. It's so strange to make a movie in which every character in the movie is someone I know personally. And Marty Landau at 23, Jimmy, we were all friends, Kazan, Strasberg. I mean, everybody in the picture, Danny Mann, all the directors, George Stevens. I was a kind of assistant to Kazan for a while in the actor studio. So it was eerie, but it's been such a terrific terrific experience because we had a real clear vision of what we wanted to do, which was to examine the torturous childhood of James Dean and to make clear how those traumas of his early life, the death of his mother when he was nine, his father's subsequent abandonment of him, were the forces that drove him to assert himself and to become the star that he became and eventually to his death. Well, good luck with it. We've run out of time, but there's a lot more questions I could ask you, Mark. I want to thank Mark Radell for his time and and all the best with James Dean. Thank you very, very much. It was a pleasure.